growing up in Amritsar, we saw no Muslims. Okay. They were, the, the, the mosques are still there. The names are still there of the streets, okay. uh, of the localities. But the ethnic cleansing was complete. Right. Virtually none survived. Uh, either they were killed or they were forced to, uh, yeah. to move. So I think there's a recognition that the violence was inflicted by both sides. Mm. There are no, um, nobody is innocent and there are no winners. There are only losers on both sides right. from the wrenching partition that we, uh, that we had. You know, General Dyer came with his uh, uh, Gorkha and Baloch uh, forces and without any warning, uh, opened a fire. According to the Hunter Commission of Inquiry that the British themselves appointed, 379 innocent unarmed persons were killed within the space of a few minutes. Um, other uh, inquiry uh, reports suggest it could have been as large as a thousand. It is the carnage, the death, the destruction, the pillage that was caused. Why? Because communal passions had been raised. Mm. You know, he, he, he writes that as India, celebrating this year 1947, and those who know me know that I have always fought for India's independence. Today, I have to step back and ask, was it worth getting our independence at the cost of our humanity? Uh, hello, Navdeep sir. Welcome on the Avaram Safi show. I'm so happy to have you here because, uh, like I was telling you off the camera as well, that for someone like me who was born 50 years after partition, uh, partition is, I think so, it's, it's history for us, for my generation. It's not emotions. And through books like these, uh, Hymns and Blood, um, which was originally named as uh, Khun De Sohile in Punjabi. So uh, books like these are our sources to know about partition. So sir, firstly, welcome on the show. Thank you very much, Ash. Pleasure to be on the show. Awesome, sir. So, uh, sir, let's start the discussion about this book, Hems and Blood, which was written by Nanak Singh Ji, uh, who is your grandfather. Uh, so why did you choose to translate your grandfather's works? So it's very interesting that my mother uh, was a uh, Punjabi language ke professor. Right. So uh, she was in this unusual situation. Ke she was an academic. Plus, she was the daughter-in-law of Nanak Singh, who was Punjabi's most famous writer. Right. And because she was an academic, she ended up teaching his novels as okay. part of the curriculum in undergrad and postgrad and so on. So she would always say, Veda, your grandfather was such a natural genius of a storyteller that if only his books had reached a wider audience than just Punjabi. Right. So this is a very old story, so they put a lot of pressure on me. 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 अंग्रेजी में ट्रांसलेट करने तो मैंने उनकी पहली किताब करीब ऑलमोस्ट 20 साल पहले की थी उसका नाम था पवित्र पापी और पवित्र पापी एक बड़ी मशहूर फिल्म भी थी 1960s में बलराज सानी परिक्षित सानी तनुजा वगैरह की तो उसको मैंने ट्रांसलेट किया था वो इट वाज पब्लिश्ड एस द वॉचमेकर क्योंकि उसका एक अहम so, उसके बाद उनका एक और नावल था अधिकरिया फुल मैंने वो किया उसके बाद उनकी एक कविता थी लंबी कविता खूनी विसाखी जलेवाला बाग कांड के बारे में और अब मैंने ये दो किताबें एक्चुअली बैक टू बैक शुरू की क्योंकि ये जैसे आपने बोला खून दे सोहले तो खून दे सोहले वाज अकंपनीड बाय अ सेकंड नावल व्हिच इज अ सीक्वल टू दिस Right. And that is called Agdi Khed. Right. So I, 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 I said, let me pick up these two novels. One, because they are about the partition. Second, because they give two very distinct uh, perspectives or dimensions on the partition. Khun de Sohle or Hymns uh, in Blood 
Hmm. This is mostly about the migration of Hindu and Sikh families from the Potohar region near Rawalpindi towards Amritsar. Right. The second book, Agdi Khed, which is tentatively being called A Game of Fire, uh, and it will come out early next year, is about what was happening in Amritsar okay. at that point of time. The beauty is that both the books are set during the first eight months of 1947. Mm. The run-up to the independence, the run-up to the partition. Right. And the other thing, you know, there's a lot of partition literature around. I think what is significant about these two books is that this one was first published in February 1948. Mm. And the second one was published in September 48. So within a year of the partition. So there's a certain rawness about them, a certain immediacy yeah, yeah. about them. Uh, which I think is unique. A Prasid Upanyaskar, who was in the same time, wrote two back to back novels based largely on what he saw and heard. And he said that these books are less fiction, more history. Or right. he calls it historical fiction. Right, right, right. So, uh, sir, like uh, as you were mentioning uh, before as well, ki, uh, grandfather ne jitni bhi kitabe likhi unme uh, like we can see ki kis tarah ka ek uh, violence us time pe erupt ho raha tha uh, between muslims and hindu sects but there is also a message of harmony so how do you think in today's modern india uh, pakistan as well uh, bangladesh included how can we see the partition today because ek bahut hi uh, ajeeb si sadness aati hai jab hum baat karte about the partition um, and there's anger as well. There are a lot of emotions that run through. And hum kitab mein bhi dekhte hai, so Bloods mein, there's uh, the festival that is going on. At that time, we can actually read that the neighbors were so many years ago, but now there's suddenly a uh, tinge of anger has under about themselves, about their neighbors because of religion. So how can we see this in the modern world? How can What kind of lessons can we take? You know, uh, that's a really good question. And that was my principal motivation that my grandfather had 38 novels I wrote these two novels. Right. Uh, and, and I thought that while we are celebrating India at 75, mm. uh, and we are celebrating the many achievements of India during the last 75 years as an independent nation, yeah. it's also worth taking a step back and reflecting on the price that the country paid, uh, particularly in Punjab and to an extent in Bengal, yeah. Uh, through the partition of, of those two uh, prominent states. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the, you know, even today we are seeing in India, certainly in Pakistan, certainly in Bangladesh, uh, elsewhere, uh, you have divisions in societies around religion, sometimes around ethnicity, sometimes around race, whatever. Agar Sri Lanka or Tamil or Sinhala uh, are in conflict, Pakistan is not a Muslim, right. Shia, or Sunni, or Ahmadiyas, or Muslim. Right? In, in Bangladesh, you have a prominent religious party which is at odds, which thinks that the government is not Islamic enough. And in right. India, of course, over the last, uh, uh, last uh, few uh, years, you've seen an, an increase in polarization uh, yeah. Um, yeah. amongst the communities. So I think a lot of that angst stems from the uh, scars of the partition, mm. uh, the wounds of the partition. And, 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 and perhaps some of them haven't still fully healed. So right. I right. believe that these novels uh, give you a very uh, uh, reassuring message that yes, there was the trauma of the partition. Mm. Yes, the terrible things were done to each other. But even then, in many cases, humanity survived. So while right. this book talks about the, uh, the uh, ethnic cleansing in, uh, in that Potoha region and how this idyllic village uh, where communities have lived together for generations is suddenly right. appended by the uh, communal wave. Um, at the same time, there are Muslims who are willing to give up their lives to save their Hindu or Sikh neighbors. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. one is a reality and the second is also a reality. So what these books do is they encourage us, don't take a black and white approach. 
and at the end of the day you know what 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 my grandfather says in the foreword of his second novel uh, is that for me i may be a devout sikh yeah but i have one higher faith and that faith he uses a line from uh, guru gobind singh's poetry which talks about the oneness of humanity he says for me if i have one creed it is that regardless of religion caste creed you are one human race and that mm. is sacred for you wow how was the journey of translating a book from punjabi to english especially a, a book about partition where there are so many emotions and i'm sure there were there might have been words or uh, probably phrases which you cannot translate from punjabi to english so can you talk about that journey yeah i mean really translation is uh, at one level for me a labor of love it is hard uh, yeah, you know sometimes you find that you can do 3 4 5 pages very quickly sometimes you are stuck on one paragraph one line right. uh, and, and 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 you know for the translator the uh, challenge uh, is to maintain this fine balance that you must remain uh, true to the originals uh, uh, that was presented mm. uh, and and yet you must make it accessible and readable in the new language that you are uh, working on and and and, and there is it almost invites you to uh take a leap of faith because my characters are speaking in english but they are characters yeah. rooted in punjab right yeah. so you are there yeah. we are already creating a little bit of a fiction okay. uh, but 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 then what you want to try and do is at least in terms of the period if people had a certain way of speaking can you capture that in english mm. so which means that i must resist my urge to translate it as i speak uh using an occasional slang or uh, yeah. whatever uh and move back to how people used to speak at that point of time right the the, the second issue which is a challenge really for translations uh, and, and and i'll tell you this one was still not that hard but i have previously tried another of my grandfather's novels and i gave up because the characters are so uh, rooted in the soil mm. uh, there's an afimchi every line that he speaks is a muhavra wow it's a proverb right every time he opens his mouth he has now that proverb may be one line mm. but it is linked to the season the climate the crop the uh, uh, social custom um, whatever and 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 there is no um, decent way mm. to to really explain that uh, yeah. in in at least not in in less than a paragraph what is what that one short line means so as a translator then you step back and say hey i'm working on one of the true classics of punjabi literature yeah do i have the right to mutilate it or should i just say mere mein itni qabiliyat nahi hai is samay ki main isko justice kar paun uh, let me wait until i feel that i have the level of proficiency and confidence to to take on the challenge right wow so uh, sir like when we talk about nanak singh ji and as you said ki his books are classics in punjabi so while growing up i'm sure you have had many conversations with him uh, can you talk about him what was the experience of growing up with such an eminent writer and what kind of things did you talk with him about the partition especially so you know i have to say that my grandfather died in 1971 at the ripe old age of 74 when i was only 12 yeah but he was a very unusual figure uh, if you look at his uh, persona he was born in a fairly poor family in jhelum district in what is now pakistan mm. uh, in a very very small village called chakhamid um he was born into a hindu family and his name originally was hansraj suri uh, okay. in the family of bahadur chand suri um his father had a little kiryana shop in peshawar so okay. when he was only 8 years old he was told you come to peshawar and help me in the shop jaise un dino pratha thi but within a year of his coming to peshawar his father died from tuberculosis okay 
and he as the eldest child was left to manage the family uh, mm. at the age of nine or uh, nine and a half and so he got no formal schooling beyond fourth grade okay and yet chauthi jamaat tak wo padhe the aur uske bawajood he produced 59 books including yeah. 28 novels um when he was in peshawar uh, and he spent the first eight nine years uh, from the age of 9 to 8 8 9 to almost 18 19 to 10 saal kareeb wo peshawar mein rahe so us samay he found that he was drifting in life uh, yeah. without a purpose uh, he wanted to do something and he didn't know what so he came under the influence of gaane ka shauk tha unko okay so unhone tab harmonium wagaira sikha and he got, came under the influence of uh, 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 a very pious uh, granthi at the gurudwara over there okay so unke influence mein at the age of 18 he decided to convert to sikhism so mm. hansraj became nanak singh okay wow and and, and, and then he uh, of course uh, uh, moved to uh, amritsar we heard these things when we were growing up because hum hum amritsar mein the unka gaon tha preetnagar which was about 15 20 miles from amritsar right so we would always summer holidays mein hamari ek reet bani hui thi ke we would go to the village spend the summer holidays sare cousins wagaira aa jate the koi bhua ke bacche koi chache ke koi taaye ke and and uh, we would uh, uh, in the evenings sit around him he would sit on his bed we yeah. would sit around him and we would say bau ji koi kahani sunao bau ji koi kahani sunao and 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 as as uh, 8 9 10 years old uh, the enduring memories that we have are that we were sitting with punjabi's greatest writer uh, and uh, impromptu spontaneously he would start narrating a story he would create characters he would create the plot he would create jokes oh. he would sometimes create music around it and for an hour or two we would be spellbound yeah yeah but 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 you know what uh, what i've learned about him i have to confess we knew him as kids as our grandfather and that was about it occasionally it would be interesting that famous people were coming home to meet him <laughs> as youngsters we were fairly blase about it for right. me the, the real discovery of nanak singh the writer actually came well into my career in the foreign service i was yeah. uh, at the indian, indian embassy in washington um uh, back in 1997 right. i was a young first secretary at the embassy at that time and uh bauji's centenary was being celebrated wow. and, and and at that time you had for the first time a punjabi prime minister ik gujral hmm. who was a great fan of my grandfather's writings wow so he did a wonderful event he released a postage stamp and a first day cover and all of that Uh, at Seven Race Course Road uh, at mm. the Prime Minister's residence, and overseas in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in New Jersey, the Punjabi community was holding events to celebrate my grandfather's centenary. Wow! And suddenly they discovered that his grandson is at the Indian Embassy, so they started inviting me as chief guest. <laughs> and somewhere the penny dropped. Oh my God! That's the legacy that I have. Yeah. that's the heritage that we uh, have what we've inherited uh, and, and and we need to be more mindful more cognizant of it mm. not just not just take it for granted yeah yeah so uh, sir i i need to ask you this because you have had like a career spanning over 36 years in foreign services and uh, you have been to many countries you have talked to a lot of people from different cultures religions um i i really want to know how do people you know uh, people outside of india how do they perceive the partition over there uh, i'm sure like they might have asked you a lot of questions about partition and what kind of uh, perception do they have you know the remarkable thing is uh, whether it was in the us or more recently in uae uh, hmm. the indian pakistani bangladeshi communities but particularly the punjabis from india and pakistan tend to converge very comfortably okay to communicate to connect very comfortably 
Uh, and, 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 and so I think what it demonstrates, you know, the moment they, the first question is, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Lahore. Oh, I'm from Amritsar, right? Uh, and, and, and it establishes a certain basis for a conversation. Right. Uh, and, 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 and you find that that conversation can be carried out without any rancor. Mm. And, and, and uh, you know, I think the point it drives home is that even after 75 years, there's something about Punjabi culture or Punjabiyat right. that transcends right. uh, both the geographical borders mm. and the religious divides. And, and, and suddenly, you know, the, in a foreign country, the ability to communicate in the same language with somebody who is <laughs> literally from, you know, Amritsar to Lahore, the distance is 35 miles. Right, right. <laughs> so, 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 so the, the, the connect can be quite uh, interesting, quite immediate. And, and so while diplomats have to be obviously more guarded in yeah. their approach, but at a, at, at a different level, you find that there is a... Um, the, the question of uh, a partition might come up, but, and, and, and you know, this, I want to add on that, that this is something I've noticed of late, uh, even when I go to Punjab every month, mm. I go to Amritsar every month, more or less. I find that most people in Punjab have gotten over the bitterness of the partition. Okay. Which is counterintuitive because this is the part which paid the highest price. Yeah. So in Amritsar, for example, you have a theater group that invites theater groups from Pakistan. They come and perform on themes that are common of, of yeah. common interest, etc. So there's a very nice connect uh, between the artists community, between the intellectuals, yeah, uh, and and even uh, businessmen who realize that if the Atari Vaga border were open for trade. It would bring prosperity to both sides. Right. So there's a vested right. interest in a normalization of uh, ties. Uh, despite, uh, you know, in the 65 war and in the 75 one war, Punjab was at the front line. Right. I mean, I remember a full army encampment in my village and the whole right. village used to cook up food and deliver hot meals to the Javans. Yeah. Uh, on, on the yeah. front line because our, our village is only three and a half, four miles from the border. Okay. Uh, but, but even though Punjab has suffered during the war, during the partition, then during the wars, then during the Khalistani movement, which is supported by the Pakistanis, yes. despite all of that, there's an underlying desire for novelization. But right. unfortunately, the further you move away from Punjab, the harder the attitudes become. Yeah. So, uh, sir, like, why do you think is that? Because, uh, as you said, the further you move away from Punjab, the uh, expressions, the emotions, they constantly keep changing. And the opinions keep changing about partition. In fact, there's, uh, if I'm not wrong, there's an organization called 1947 Partition Archive. And they keep doing these events where they bring authors from uh, Pakistan. They bring in authors from India who talk about partition. And I always see that, just uh, like India, mein log ke ki there have been mosques jo partition ke baad ab khali khali se reh gaye hai the people who are on the other side of the border they say ki wahan pe kafi sare gurudwara hai jo ab khali se reh gaye because the punjabi community more or less shifted from there to india in proper india so how do you think this change has happened i think dekho uh, let's not forget ki jab again because i am from amritsar i am giving you as an example so when we talk about the trauma of partition, when we see how many Hindu and Sikh uh, families were uprooted, first they came to Amritsar, then they became refugee colonies in Delhi. If there was a growth in Delhi ho hu originally, to it was because of the influx of people who came in uh, from across uh, the border. Uske babjood, people have a certain stake mm. in, the, in, in the relationship. Amritsar may 1947 may according to the 1941 census 43% population Muslim thi. okay 43% yeah that's a right. huge uh, <laughs> and, 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 and certainly you know so the Hindus and Sikhs together were 57% uh, 
बट ग्रोइंग अप इन अमृतसर we saw no muslims okay they were the their the mosques are still there the names are still there of the streets okay. uh of the localities but the ethnic cleansing was complete right okay. virtually none survived uh, either they were killed or they were forced to uh, yeah. to move so i think there's a recognition that the violence was inflicted by both sides hmm there are no um nobody is innocent and there are no winners there are only losers on both sides right. from the wrenching partition that we uh, that we had so right. i think what books like these do is tell you that story hmm. of what was life before and what it became and 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 and, and that's why you know um the 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 words of uh, my grandfather are so strong and so powerful uh, in terms of reflecting and uh, you know yeah. if you agree i can read out a small Please section sir. for your for your readers yeah so you know my 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 grandfather starts uh, in his foreword um by explaining why he has written this book uh, and and he says as i start writing these lines today I have this gnawing pain in my gut, a feeling of futility about everything that I have read or written since 1929. Everything's gone down the drain. My dreams of seeing this country stand tall and united have crumbled into dust. My eyes, yes, the same ones that had witnessed Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs sip from the same glass of water, are mute spectators to the carnage unfolding before us. they have seen brothers drink each other's blood how i wish the good lord had closed these eyes forever spared them the trauma of having to see what they have seen one short year that's all it took to bring our nation to this calamity who could have imagined it and he goes on to say uh, what lies behind this compulsion of mine of writing this book maybe it was this picture imprinted in my eyes one that will continue to shine bright till the day that the shadow of death arrives to cast cast a pall around it an image of my beautiful and vibrant punjab which i have not just seen with my eyes but also experienced with my soul much of my childhood and youth were spent in a milieu where the muslim and non muslim communities lived in complete harmony where they didn't just live as peaceful neighbors but were ready to sacrifice their lives for their neighbor's sake where every plate of food and glass of water was shared pieces of that picture lie shattered around me today and this novel is an attempt to show my readers some of those pieces but this book isn't just a novel it's a reflection of the ache in my heart the scream from the very pits of my stomach the wail from the depths of my soul in writing this book my pen has relied on the tears flowing from my eyes as much as it has on the ink from my ink pot so that's how moved he was yeah. by the carnage that he saw around him. yeah yeah and um, i i don't even know how to uh, put these feelings into words which he has um and as soon as i started reading the book um, i think so i i talked to you about the book on call as well and there were some emotions which i still cannot describe because the book hits you very hard and especially for my generation it's you it hits you hard because partition humne sirf school mein padha it was something jo hame score marks score karne ke liye humne padha tha and now when i read novels like these uh, that is when i realize ki partition was actually something that was huge it was something which shattered lives of millions of people um and so uh, one one question which i wanted to ask you before we talk about uh, kuni vesapi uh, which is about the colonial rule um somewhere after reading your grandfather's books and translating his books do you think that the partition it could have been managed better um maybe the riots could have been managed better it was just something of a political plot by the colonial rulers look there's no question about that and there's enough historical uh, writing about um the british almost abdicating their responsibility Mm. um and and you know there's a reference in the forward again that my grandfather has done that 
where were your tanks and your right. fierce some fighter planes and your uh, cannons and all you had said that we will not let any blood be spilled and now you are just bystanders because yeah. you are just interested in packing your bags and leaving rather than doing something to restore <clears throat> law and order <clears throat> so that sentiment about the um, culpability of british rule uh, of first because of their own political reasons having set an impossibly tight deadline okay. for the partition then having brought in sir cyril radcliffe who had no experience of india to literally sit on a map and try and divide using whatever demographic data was uh, available to him a line that cuts through villages and homes literally yeah. uh, you know yeah. so 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 uh, you know today with the benefit of hindsight we can say why what would have happened if you had waited for another year and done a more thorough job what would have happened if you had given communities more time to adjust to the idea mm. rather than to see the greatest exodus of human beings ever seen in the history of mankind 14 right. million people displaced you know that was the scale of the displacement that you uh, that you saw happening so I, i mean there is no question that the 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 british were at uh, uh, at fault and 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 not just that but i think they feared and this is now revealed by some of the uh, earlier um, documents that have come to public light they feared the idea of a strong united india that could be a major force in this part of the world uh, at that point of time their interests were better served in a weakened india that mm. would be busy with pakistan and 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 the local troubles would keep brewing and 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 in a sense they also saw that could a pakistan be a useful western agent in right. this part of the world because people like nehru and gandhi were way too independent in their uh, thinking of how they visualized and the art of that patel for that matter or, or or so many other stalwarts of the time so i think the 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 british uh, policy of divide and rule um, really uh, damaged india it was catastrophic for us uh, yeah. right from the time that they created separate electorates for muslims separate ones for sikhs the you know instead of having everybody vote for a particular candidate you start thinking of voting in terms of your communities mm. and, and i think that's where the seeds of uh, division that we see today uh, were sown right and uh, to especially the the uh, major parts like punjab from where uh, a lot of soldiers were recruited for the world war 1 in Brit- uh, british era so uh, that was i don't know like how how you can do something like that to those people who have helped you who have uh, fought for you and uh, from that same uh, conversation let's talk about puni vaisakhi because it talks about the jallianwala bagh massacre so uh, sir uh, please please tell us uh, tell our audience about the poem and what it is exactly about so um you know very briefly um my grandfather as a 22 year old in amritsar uh, had gone to jallianwala bagh with two of his friends to protest against the rawlat act mm. and i want to just clarify some history here because sometimes there is this notion that people had gone to celebrate visakhi yes it was visakhi but there were no celebrations because amritsar was under curfew right. there had already been violence uh, on the uh, 10th of april uh, and 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 so there was a feeling of anger in the city people were upset gandhi ji had got, given a call for satyagraha against the rawlat act on the 30th of march and he had called for a hartal on the 6th of Uh, mm. april so that's the run up to the uh, events right. so these are people ordinary people who had gathered into this compound uh, which was walled from all four sides and had just a narrow entry point uh, that's where they had got, gathered to uh, vent their anger against the rawlat act and to figure out what is to be done next in terms of the uh, protests and in a right. sense they were responding to the call given by gandhi ji mm. um, and 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 uh, uh, you know general dyer came with his uh, uh, gorkha and baloch uh, forces 
and without any warning uh, opened a fire. According to the Hunter Commission of Inquiry that the British themselves appointed, 379 innocent unarmed persons were killed within the space of a few minutes. Um, other uh, inquiry uh, reports suggest it could have been as large as a thousand mm. uh, killed within, uh, within that space. Uh, so a lot of people think that Jallianwala Bagh was the defining moment in India's freedom struggle when the British lost the legitimacy to rule. Right. Uh, when somebody like Mahatma Gandhi, who was until then a loyalist of the British Empire, became a staunch nationalist. Somebody like Rabindranath Tagore, who had been knighted by the British, wrote this famous resignation letter, yeah. giving up his knighthood because whatever feeling they may have had about British civilization was gone. And, and after 1919, it was really downhill for the British Empire in, 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 in India. Yeah. But the reason people were so angry was, as you correctly mentioned, Punjab had contributed almost half a million uh, troops to the First World War effort. Right. And there was promise by the British that they would uh, they would uh, uh, look at the demands for greater autonomy uh, more favorably once the war was over. And that didn't happen. What happened in, in contrast was that this uh, Rowlett Act was brought in uh, and, and, and it had this famous thing that people com complained. No Dalil, no Vakil, no Appeal. That there was nothing that you could do if the police picked you up and uh, yeah. and, and, and arrested you. So uh, my grandfather um, saw both of his friends getting killed in the firing. He himself was knocked unconscious in the stampede that uh, ensued and um, was literally left among the dead. So he walked away from there, traumatized, recovered after some time, and then wrote this long poem, which was first published in May 1920, and promptly banned by the British and confiscated. All copies were confiscated. Wow. Uh, so uh, anyway, we rediscovered that poem through some coincidences 60 years later. I had the privilege of translating it into English uh, to mark the centenary of Jalemala Bagh in 2019. Yeah. Um, that just one objective that it should that message should reach a wider audience because very much like hymns in blood, I believe that Khuni Visakhi is also a piece of contemporaneous history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it is through an eyewitness who was there and writing and commenting on what he uh, saw. What I'll do is uh, just maybe read a very short passage oh. from Khuni Visakhi for your uh, listeners. This is about the time that General Dyer comes uh, and starts firing. And it starts like this. 5.30 sharp, the clock had struck. Thousands gathered in the bag, my friends. Leaders came to lament the nation's woes, taking turns to speak out loud, my friends. Voiced grievance, hardship, anger, sorrow, saying no one listens to us, my friends. What can we do? What options left? Can't see any ray of light, my friends. Those words forlorn, they barely voiced, came soldiers thundering down, my friends. At Dyer's command, those Gurkha troops gathered in a formation tight, my friends. Under tyrant's orders, they opened fire straight into innocent hearts, my friends and fire and fire and fire they did. Some thousands of bullets were shot, my friends. Like searing hail, they felled our youth, a tempest not seen before, my friends. Riddled chests and bodies slid to the ground, each one a target large, my friends. Haunting cries for help did rend the sky, smoke rose from smoldering guns, my friends. Just a sip of water was all they sought. Valiant youth lay dying in the dust, my friends. That narrow lane to enter the bag sealed off on Dyer's command, my friends. 
No exit, no escape, no way out was left, making Bagh a deathly trap, my friends. A fortunate few somehow survived, while most died then and there, my friends. Some ran with bullets ripping their chest, stumbling to their painful end, my friends. Others caught the bullet while running away, dropping lifeless in awkward heaps, my friends. In minutes, the bog so strewn with corpses, none knew just who was who, my friends. Many of them did look like Sikhs amid Hindus and Muslims plenty, my friends. In prime of their youth, our brave hearts lay, gasping for one last breath, my friends. Long hair lay matted in blood and grime, in slumber deep, they sleep, my friends. Says Nanak Singh, who knows their state, but God, the one and only, my friends. You can see it's very visual, very yeah. I, I I have tears in my eyes. I have goosebumps right now because uh, I have been to Jalinwala Bath before it it got renovated. Um, I, I, I have seen who jo gali hai jahan se andar jate hai. Um, and I went on a Sunday, which was like a rush hour day. So I could actually sense ki to just move in wahan pe kitna zyada difficult hai. Now I think so they have renovated it for uh, some reason. They have expanded the whole uh, gali. Um, but sir, like how do you deal with such emotions? Like I don't know because poems, uh, sometimes they, they say a lot when you cannot say anything. And I, I just want to know, how do you deal with such emotions? It's wrenching, you know, uh, when you're translating also, uh, like your emotions, there were times that I was trying to translate and I had tears in my eyes yeah. uh, because, you know, mind you, this is a translation, but the original is even more powerful and moving and, and yeah. raw. So, so you know, uh, you're dealing with it emotionally and you're dealing with it intellectually that can I do justice to this? Can I try and transmit to the reader in English the same emotion that my grandfather was trying to convey through his uh, his, his, his words, uh, you know? And uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, what I have to say is, you, you said something very interesting initially. You said as a young person, um, you have forgotten about the partition. But let me tell you something. I was born some years before you, but, and I was born in Amritsar. Right. And yet, and yet we were so ignorant and complacent about our own history, mm. even in Amritsar. And, and, and so I really feel that, you know, there is this old saying, those who uh, forget the lessons of history are bound to repeat it. Yeah. I think we owe it to ourselves as part of our larger education. We are studying so much. We are studying America, Rus, Ukraine. We are studying our own home. Let us know thyself. Because until we don't understand our past, we won't be able to appreciate our future. We won't be able to appreciate what sacrifices went into bringing us where we are today. Yeah, but so, sir, let, uh, me, let me ask you this one question. Why is it important to study about the partition? Why is it important to uh, go back to those pages of history? Because when I talk to people of my age, um, somewhere we have just forgotten that. Because I have interest in history, I read about it. But to those people who don't have any you know, interest in history, they keep asking me, why do you want us to read about the partition? So what is your answer to them? Bye. Up to it is an essential part of our geography also, na? Hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it, it isn't just history, it's geography also. The fact yeah. that the country was uh, uh, divided the way it was and, 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 and the uh, uh, scars that it, it left uh, and the fact that you are st still seeing continuation of uh, uh, conflicts that started 75 years ago. Yeah. So, I think that if we are making Amrit Mahotsav, if you are celebrating 75 years of independence, so at least know how it came about. Yeah. Do, and, and, and you know, while it's easy to carry a tiranga and uh, 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 do janganman or 
Vande Matram, it's important that the spirit behind that freedom struggle is understood. I mean, somewhere I wrote that my grandfather was writing this poem when the Rowlett Act was still in force. Right. Look at the courage that people had. Mm-hmm. As a 22-year-old, you're not afraid. You're still fiercely writing in, in, in somewhere else in this poem. He says, Oh, Dyer, you are a murderer and you will forever in history be remembered as one. Yeah, strong words for somebody to write under British rule at that time. So no wonder the book was banned and all. And yeah. later my grandfather also went, went to jail. But I think, you know, young people like you and through your program, your friends, your listeners, I think have an obligation to know your past, to know thyself. Yeah. You know, um, otherwise, I think you're just poorer going forward. Right, right. And that's such an important message for the year today. Um, so one last question before we uh, end this podcast, which is um, a lesson that your grandfather might have wanted to give to the generation of today, like um, to the modern India. What what message would that? Be? I think his message, uh, uh, which is which endures, is do not fall for um, political slogans that create religious divides. Mm. That if you allow communities to be divided on religious lines everybody will end up poorer. There will be no winners. And and I think if there is one lesson that comes through his partition novels in particular, it is the carnage, the death, the destruction, the pillage that was caused. Why? Because communal passions had been raised. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he writes that as India celebrating this year 1947, And those who know me know that I have always fought for India's independence. Today, I have to step back and ask, was it worth getting our independence at the cost of our humanity? Because what I have seen is people lose their humanity. The butchery was so savage that how could human beings do this to other human beings? And that's what communal passions can trigger. And that's what you need to be mindful of. So next time somebody tries to incite your religious sentiment by saying something, be very, very careful. That's the message. Wow. So so, uh, thank you so much for doing this podcast because this was a very important podcast, I feel, especially for people of my age. And I keep saying this because I have literally had conversations with people of my age who think colonial rule was better for India, who think partition was uh, not so much violent as it has been shown. But they are far away from truth. So this podcast was very important for them. Um, Sir, thank you so much for doing this. And I would request all the audience to go out there, buy this book. And there are a few more books available. You can buy those on Amazon or nearest uh, bookstores. I'll put the link in description as well. So please go ahead, buy this book. Thank you so much, Sir, for doing this podcast. Thank you, Jayesh. Thank you. Pleasure.